The next person that we'll hear from is Dr. Gordon, and he's been a strong advocate of integrative and functional medicine. And he likes to promote wellness through looking at underlying hormone deficiencies. And he's a pioneer of looking at hormones for brain health. He's authored two books. He holds a voluntary position at the Keck School of Medicine. And he's the medical director of CBS Studios and also consults to major and national news programs as well. Dr. Gordon promotes, promotes hormonal replenishment protocols to overcome anxiety and depression, as well as brain injury and trauma. To share his work on trauma and underlying hormone decline, please welcome to the stage Dr. Mark Gordon. How's everybody doing? Great. Okay, since I have a three hour lecture in 13 and a half minutes, let's go. Well, obviously from the topic of this presentation, you think we're going to be talking about something about mental illness. Well, we are. We're going to talk about depression. And even more importantly, we're going to talk about why treatment fails. Why treatment fails. And this is an important uh, issue when you consider that over 43 million people living in the United States are on one or multiple antidepressants. And they're still depressed. They are still depressed. My own journey started about 20 years ago when I was labeled with what was being called maturity onset depression. Notice I didn't say diagnosed because I don't remember ever having an objective clinical test to quantify or qualify the under, underlying condition. Nonetheless, I was started on an antidepressant uh, to address anger, uh, loss of focus, insomnia, obesity, lack of libido. But even on the antidepressant, I was still depressed. I was still depressed. And it wasn't until years later that reading the literature, it talked about something called treatment-resistant depression, a finding that is all too common in people who have had traumatic brain injury, head injury. And I myself had had five head injuries. Fortunately, I thought, without loss of consciousness which is irrelevant, really. But it wasn't until sometime in the late 1990s that I had a comprehensive chemical assessment that included a very diverse hormonal assessment. And I was found to have low or low normal levels of growth hormone, testosterone, and thyroid hormones. At that time, it was thought that it was because of my age or because of genetic predisposition. But subsequently, I was placed on treatment that included growth hormone, testosterone, and also armor thyroid. And I started to feel better within a few weeks. And then by three months, I was back in the gym. I was doing taekwondo, got a second degree black belt. I was flirting, getting laid, losing weight, and starting to enjoy life again. Additionally, my mental, emotional state had stabled off. I have three daughters, and they appreciated that. Uh, was stabling off, and my cognitive functioning had improved. The cognitive imp improvement was so pervasive that I started getting involved with medical organizations that specialized in anti-aging, like A4M. And I started giving lectures on hormone replacement therapy, and people were listening to what I was saying. But it wasn't until 2004, while doing preparation for a new lecture, addressing the influence of hormones on the neuropsycho behavior and um, cognition that I had my epiphany. I came across this article from Turkey discussing the high incidence of growth hormone deficiency in pugilists, a popular sport in Turkey, along with carpet rolling and baba ganoush competitions. This article spoke, um, yeah, uh, this article spoke about the repetitive head trauma in boxers, and that caused my one light bulb to go off that was my aha moment. Now, having consumed that article like Turkish taffy, I went back to my patient population and started asking those patients who had already been on antidepressants if they've ever had any head or bodily injury. And that might have included a car accident, a motorcycle accident, a slip and fall, tripping over the dog, tripping over the cat, blast trauma, repetitive gunfire, a slip, um, amusement park rides, a prolonged surgery, a cerebral infarct or stroke, CTE also, or even a difficult birth. 
And the overwhelming response was, yes. yes. At that point, we started looking at the uh, literature from any and all area of medicine that had any kind of association between trauma and hormonal deficiency. And we're going to call that the A equals B scenario, where head trauma leads to hormonal deficiency. Then we looked at the neuropsychobehavioral literature for any articles that suggested a relationship between hormonal deficiencies, such as with DHEA, pregnenolone, progesterone, testosterone, growth hormone, vitamin D, and also any increase in cortisol and a relationship between neuropsychocognitive effects. We're going to call that the B equals C scenario. And needless to say, there are a lot of articles that were read to come to the following conclusion, or near conclusion. Therefore, putting these two scenarios together as a transitive equation, if A equals B and B equals C, then A has to equal C. If head trauma leads to hormonal dysfunction, and hormonal dysfunction leads to personality or neuropsychobehavioral changes, that head trauma must lead to depression, the A equals C component. And this is where the problem lies, in that we have ignored the B equals C component, which is the relationship between the influence of hormones on both our emotional state and our cognitive abilities. Then the question became, if you could improve upon the B, would C improve? It was that, excuse me, sorry, I used that back button. It was that question that became the foundation of work we do in the office for the past 12 years in neuroendocrinology. And it's all based upon uh, science that already exists. It's just not being read or applied. Such as this article. This is a 30-year perspective study looking at neuropsychobehavioral problems that develop over time after traumatic brain injury. This is not PTSD. This is traumatic brain injury. That's the reason why we continue to have the loss of 40 veterans per day, 113 citizens per day, which is about 9.5 suicides per minute, or 9.5, um, one suicide per 9.5 minutes. It's because we're labeling and we're not diagnosing the condition. And then looking at uh, these statistics will help us to predict and project statistics on what to anticipate in tomorrow's rate of suicide increase. That's because as long as we continue to ignore the science that already exists and we fail to adapt our thinking to incorporate what's being said into treatment for traumatic brain injury, we'll continue to use medication to mask the symptoms instead of treating the underlying root causes. There we go. So what's the causative relationship between trauma and the progression to neurocognitive and neurobehavioral dysfunction? It turns out that besides the acute physical phase or trauma to the brain, there's the induction of a number of inflammatory processes in the brain. Some of them you might have heard of, like necrosis, apoptosis, or apoptosis for your English-speaking countries, Autophagia and parthenitose, regardless of their names, they all induce destruction of brain cells and alter the physiology, the biochemistry of the brain that interrupts the natural functioning. Think of it as a fire starting in a house, corner of the house, that steps room by room, step by step, burning down a room until the house is out of structure and it collapses into itself. The same thing happens in the brain due to inflammation, and free radicals which promote further damage. In a process that's called cavitation, a little area of injury, a little neuron that's been um, ruptured, or a blood vessel that's leaking, that it can expand over time and lead to an enlargement of the area of damage, such that over time, in up to 17 years, some of the research has shown it, 17 years before you start having the symptomatology that leads you to your doctor. This is how progressive symptoms occur. Then the sometimes not so subtle inflammation caused by mild traumatic brain injury, we think that you have to have severe in a coma. Not the case. Don't need to have that. 
to have mild traumatic brain injury can also have devastating effects on the brain. Maybe not immediately, but over time. And just because we can't feel it as pain does not mean it's not happening. And this is what's been referred to as the stealth syndrome, or as the signature wound of both Gulf Wars. Whether the neurotrauma is a singular event or multiple events, the signs and symptoms can take days, weeks, and months to develop. And by the patient it becomes clinically symptomatic and presents at a doctor's office, the trauma has been forgotten. And more likely than not, they're started on one or multiple antidepressants. Now let's clarify a couple of uh, terms that we use quite often now. Neuroactive steroids are those hormones that are produced in the peripheral body, from the thyroid, from the adrenal glands, from the, test, uh, the ovaries and the testes. Neuroactive or neurosteroids are identical to the neuroactive steroids, but they're produced in the brain by specific cells called glial cells. And these have a very rapid effect on neuronal function at the cell membrane. So the interruption of cellular physiology caused by inflammation and this oxidative stress or this oxidative load leads to failure of the glial cells to function, and they stop producing these neurosteroids, among other regulatory chemicals of the brain. And I'll stress, neurosteroids are hormones of and by the brain which have been found to function as neuroregulatory messengers that influence both uh, neuronal behavior and cognition. This is achieved by regulation of some of the different neuroreceptors in the brain. The two that are on this page are the GABA receptors, which are the sedation or the inhibitory ones, and then the NMDA ones, which are the excitatory, helps with memory, recall, or activity level. Also, these neurosteroids have been found to reduce inflammation and are free radical scavengers, and they provide neuroprotection as well as neuroregeneration. Another important factor is that all these neuroactive steroids and neurosteroids are all derived from cholesterol. Therefore, when we use certain medications that we won't mention, what will happen is you'll have interruption of the production of cholesterol, and therefore you'll have loss of all these neuroactive steroids. Now, understanding that depression is the most common occurring syndrome associated with traumatic brain injury, and also the most important precursor for suicide, I needed to understand a little bit more. So I went back to the literature and looked at 2000 to 2012 at the literature that associated hormones with onset of depression. And I used Google Scholar, and I put in the Boolean question about testosterone and depression, and then subsequently on each of those hormones as you see on the chart. The results were more than I had ever anticipated. If I may, Duvid, David, question for you. Between 2000 and 2012, how many articles do you think were written on testosterone and depression? Guess. A thousand, good number. Okay, as a group, since we're here as a group, as a new family, newfound family, how many articles do you think were written on estradiol and depression? between 2000 and 2012? How many? Thousand, zero. What else? Good. You ready? There are over 70,000 articles written between 2000 and 2012 on the association of testosterone and depression. Almost 100,000 on estradiol, 235,000 on thyroid, and you can see progesterone, and also on growth hormone, things that we have totally ignored. And then looking at the Scientific American uh, article recently published, is depression just bad chemistry? I'd like to propose that it has nothing to do with bad chemistry, but deals with the lack of chemistry, and more specifically, the neurosteroids. Looking beyond at a con another controversial hormone, like growth hormone, which has long been thought a hormone of uh, abuse, which I've been on for 24 years. It appears to have very important effects on regulation of our emotional stability, overall energy. As you can tell, I've got a little bit of extra energy. Overall energy and quality of sleep. 
It has also been found to help repair neurons. We talked about Alzheimer's disease, the breakdown of the microtubules, the tuberlin A and B and the tau protein. Well, what growth hormone does is repairs it if we had the opportunity to use it without all the governmental restrictions and making it difficult for us to use it. In my lectures on growth hormone, it is the cardinal hormone in the body that regulates every other hormone from vitamin D to testosterone to, test, uh, to thyroid from T4 to T3. Well, I can spend hours, if you're fortunate, days and weeks if you're unfortunate, going through articles that address the major and minor hormones and their documented benefits on brain functioning as well as influence on emotional health. But as you know, my time's ticking away. So what's the good news? It always has to be a, a good statement. So what's the good news? The good news is if you take a patient and test them for their hormones, including the neuroactive steroids and the neurosteroids, and replenish them, while at the same time concurrently addressing inflammation and oxidative stress, you can take a decorated Green Beret sergeant off of 13 medications, stop his alcohol addiction within three to four weeks, and watch him aspire to become the CEO and co-founder of the fastest growing veteran 5013C foundation predicated predicated on pro providing free medical assessment and treatment to veterans suffering from over-medication and neglect due to TBI. Andrew Marr, would you please stand up? My partner in providing, in a year, 137 veterans with treatment, getting them off of their medication onto natural products that spares their life, they're back working, back having their families at Stanford Business School. In the past 12 years, working with veterans, professional athletes, civilians, traumatic brain injury, uh, civilians with traumatic brain injury, we have found that through assessment and comprehensive replacement of the deficient neurosteroids, neuroactive steroids, leads to symptomatic improvement in both psychological and physical well-being, thereby enabling most, if not all, to get off their polypharmacy. In keeping with the premise of this festival to life, La Chaim, this all begs the question, is longevity just about adding years to our life, or it is about making sure that each and every day is a positive and productive experience, not altered by illness or the effects of medication? Well, with that said, I'm still looking for the proverbial Prozac land, which gets a lot of attention, but to this day, has never been found. Thank you very much. <laughs>